Oh God, again, as we gather in your name, what we ask, O oh Lord, is for your presence to guide us and direct us. We pray for uh, the concerns that have been mentioned. Uh, we know that there are others. Uh, many of these we will write down and carry those with us, um, not just in a, as a form of discipline of praying and intercession, but really as a burden that we carry. And uh, though burdens can be heavy, it's not without joy that we don't carry in these uh, so that we can pray, so that we can stand along with, so that we can love. And, and, and we ask for your, for your help in these. Uh, and, and however it would manifest itself, O oh God, um, we're open to that. Um, and at the same time, for our, our time of study, uh, reflective learning is what we're after, which means we don't only want to learn it because it's in something uh, in the scriptures, and but we're we want learning that is applied to life, and so that our life becomes a portrait of what it's like to be connected to you and to allow that to uh, move in, in every direction um, in our, and for us to see it inside of ourselves, for other people to see it. Um, what, what we really want is to be a witness, uh, a witness of your grace, a witness of your mercy, a witness of your holiness. Uh, we, we want people to see Christ in us. Um, not only is our hope of glory, but the hope of glory for the world. And, and so we pray for this. And we want this time to be a part of that process of our, of our growth, of our maturation. And we want our faith to be, to be moved, to be dynamic, uh, not stagnant. Uh, so grant us clarity. I, I know in with all the lives that are here, uh, it, just all the things that are floating on around this place, from events to, to schedules, uh, things that we carry, if, if for a moment we could park those at the door and have uh, focus and to have a, a sense of uh, openness to your Holy Spirit, uh, this is what we humbly ask. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, so where we ended it last week is we have, coming out of Exodus 32, and I, I know we, we sort of went to the back of the book and then we came back and, look, and, and went back and, and dealt with this golden calf incident. Um, it, it was considered a great sin, uh, which that phrase is, is not thrown around uh, often in the Bible. It's definitely not thrown around in often in the book of Exodus. And, uh, and so where we left it, uh, you know, there's been a fair amount of punishment. There was obviously the people that were involved in it. Uh, there's, you know, Moses comes down off the mountain. He and, and some of the uh, Levites strap on swords. They, uh, they go through the camp. They kill those that were involved with that. Uh, Moses destroys the golden calf. He mixes it with water, makes the people drink it. Uh, you know, and so when we leave it, you know, we really don't know how it, you know, what's next. Uh, and so this is the follow-up to that. And, uh, and this, is, this is, I think chapter 33 is fantastic. And uh, because you really get insight into uh, God's care for people. Uh, really seen through uh, through through the, the children of Israel. So what we'll do, just sort of in in format, is we're going to go through the whole of the chapter uh, fairly quickly and just seeing what it says. So we'll have a frame of reference, and then we're going to come back and pick out pieces of it and sort of plow up the ground. So keep in mind, thirty-two just happened. Uh, that you've, uh, you know, that Moses went to the people. You have sinned a great sin. Uh, I'm going to go up to the Lord and you know see if I can work this thing out. Uh, and uh, and the way we leave it is that, you know, it's it's been a fair amount of punishment going on. So, 
The Lord said to Moses, Go leave this place, you and the people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, and go to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the, the Havites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But, listen to this, but I will not go among you, or I will consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Uh, that's, an, that's a phrase that in the beginning of this, the first part is typical language that God has already spoken to the people. But when we get to verse 3, this phrase right here, if you're looking at the screen, but this is new. And we're going to look at that more in a second. When the people heard these harsh words, they mourned, and no, and no one put on ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You are stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I will consume you. So now take off your ornaments, uh, and I, will, and I uh, will decide what to do to you. Therefore the Israelites stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. The next phrase or the next group of verses have to deal with the tent. Um, Moses used, uh, now Moses used uh, to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called the, the tent, he called it the tent of meetings, and everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meetings, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would arise, stand, each of them, at the entrance of the tent, and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of the cloud uh, standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would, would rise and bow down, all of them, at the entrance of their tent. Thus the Lord said, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then he would return to the camp, but his young assistant, jo Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent. And then we get into a different portion of, of verses that have to deal with uh, what, what I would argue takes place inside the tent. It's some level of Moses. It's an intercession that Moses has uh, with God. Uh, it, it doesn't say that you're in the tent, but we can make that assumption. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I, now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a, uh, see, there is a place by me where you, st you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. All right, so this is what we got <clears throat> in this whole intercession of what takes place after uh, the, the golden calf. And uh, if we were... If we were going to title this, you know, uh, now that sin has entered into the mix, what happens? That's basically what's going on in, in chapter 33. Um, and what we find right off the bat is in verse 31, I mean, verse uh, chapter 33, verse 1, the Lord is renewing Moses' commission to lead. Remember, that was called in question in verse 32. I mean, in chapter 32. Remember, in chapter 32, Moses goes up on the mountain. He's there for a long time. There are people that come to Aaron and say, we don't know where he's at, what he's doing, if he's even doing anything. 
So let us make for us some gods that will lead us. And then, of course, it, it rolls downhill. And so in 33, we have, uh, we have God, uh, the Lord, renewing Moses' commission to lead and to reiterate the destination where, where they are going. Now, why would that be important? Because he's done this like, what, five times already in the book of Exodus? What's that? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, all of this is in light of, you know, they, they come out of Egypt. Everything's going well. They get to the mountain. Uh, they have these ascents that go up and down. At some point uh, along this, there's the concept of a great sin, and that's what we looked at last week. And so the, the question is, now what? Now what do we do? We, have, we haven't had this before. So <clears throat> what, what's going to happen? Are we finished? Is, it, uh, is, the, you know, is this the whole extent of Exodus now, that we've come out of Egypt and we're just going to live on the mountain forever? And, and what you have is the Lord renewing everything. You know, I'm, I'm going to renew, Moses, you still are the man that's leading. And, and this is also where we're going. This right here, I sw you know, the land to which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we were to go back and look at the beginning of the book of Exodus, when God first call, calls Moses into this leadership position, what he tells them is that you're going to go to the land. Whose land? The one I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob, um, you know, when you get home or if you've got a computer or whatnot, uh, you know, you can Google up the phrase, you know, which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the book of Exodus. And you're going to see these bookends uh, all, all the time where, where whenever God describes the, the land, he either uses milk or honey, the land of, of the Canaanites, or he'll use uh, the land which I swore to and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this is not new language, this part right here. This isn't new language. This is old language that has already showed up in the book of Exodus. Uh, and, and so God is renewing in light of what has happened. Uh, and He's also renewing Moses. Also, th think about the times in the book of Exodus uh, whenever Moses goes through uh, what I would call difficult situations, he, you know, uh, he kills the Egyptian, he's on the run for a long period of time, Moses, burning bush experience, he, he, you have his call. After that, he, he goes down or he goes back, it doesn't work, he, you know, that gets renewed. And then later on, he's out uh, you know, in those four... Uh, events that take place from the time they leave uh, Egypt to, or from the plagues to the time before they go up on the mountain and there are those four little stories that we have they need manna they need water that you know uh, then, then God comes to Moses again then you have this whole incident so God comes back to Moses and, and God is renewing again Moses' leadership um, uh, and that's significant because this happens a few times in the book of Exodus. Now, what I think is just fascinating around that is that um, what does this say then about what does God do when He calls people into service, leadership, or whatever it would, would, be, would be? It's not just, uh, all right, Ann, this is what you got to do, have at it, and you, know, you can come back and see me whenever it's all done. I mean, there's a sense of where God is paying attention all the way along. And that's comforting for us, that God, uh, God not only qualifies the called, but God walks hand in hand along the way. And so, I mean, just let that sink in for a second. If it's not, this is not something to where, you know, here's, here's what you've got to do, go and do it, and when it gets done, you know, come and punch your card in and you know and then, then we'll be gone you know God is walking all along the way and and leading those who lead and and when there's time when there needs to be renewal there's renewal 
Uh, when there needs to be encouragement, there's encouragement. When there needs to be a stern sense of boundary and direction and, and go and go, uh, I mean, you find in God this, you know, God leading along the way. Um, now, one of the questions we could ask, is this just something for Moses? And that's a fair question. Is it just something that applies to Moses? Or is it something that we can say Moses is an example of how God how God's nature uh, acts with people, and obviously we see it in, in the life of Moses, but can we also extrapolate that or, or make the jump into our own life and look at our own life and see that God does the same thing as well? That's the beautiful part to me. You know, Wesley, many people would ask John Wesley, well, how do I know? And, and Wesley's response would be, well, you can read in the Scriptures, and you can see what God does with people in the Scriptures. And he said, that's, that's good. And, and that requires logic and, and the ability to comprehend. He said, but the real, the real force behind that is not is when you read and you see what happens, and then you reflect back in your life and you see the same thing. And he calls that the witness of the Spirit. And that's powerful. And, and, and I, so I want us to stop. I mean, the reason why we're really going to focus on 33 is because this is an incredible chapter in all of the Bible. It's, it's, it's fantastic in the book of Exodus, but, but it, it's, it's, it's larger than that. And so what God is doing, God is renewing. This is not new language. This is same language that's been, that's been throughout the, the book of Exodus. And, uh, I mean, the, the, it's the, the difference is here. Now we get to this, and this is a new phrase. But I will not go among you, or I will consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Now what are we to make of this? Because he's promised an angel. That's what we have in verse... Hang on, sorry. What we have in, in verse 2 is that I'm going to send an angel before you. Now... Earlier in the book of Exodus, God said, I'll go with you. And so there's a little bit of a change here, maybe, uh, that an angel now is going to be the substitute for God. Um, and the reason why is because of this right here. Yeah, because you're, you're oop, I thought maybe I could make a hot, yeah, I can, all right, good. All right, just learn that right here. So uh, <laughs> reflective learning happening right in your midst, right? Uh, do what? Yeah, it was, yeah. John has, he just looks at the screen and it does it. I have to do trial and error. But, uh, um, but this is a new phrase right here. But I will not go among you, or I will consume you on the way, for you are, are a stiff-necked people. Um, notice that he doesn't say, because you have committed a great sin. I, I might. All right. Uh, do you, I might destroy you. Uh, does anybody else have, who else has something else other than what's on the screen or what, uh, what's been read? I might, right. I may, uh, I would, yeah. Uh, the closer, the, the closer, this is interesting. Um, the closer translation is I would con consume you. The reason why the editor has put might is look down and when we get to this part right here, we have a promise that it's not the angel that'll go, but that God will go himself. <clears throat> Read again from chapter, I mean, verse 12, all the way to verse. Yeah, start at verse, let's, let's look at it. Moses said to the Lord, because what's happening is God has just said, you know, we're still going to the same place. You're still going to be the leader. But the difference is I'm going to give you an angel to go now because I'm not going to go. And the reason why is you're stiff-necked people. Now, here's where you see the power of intercession. And this is why I want to focus on this too as well. Moses, inside the tent, remember he's in the, he, this is a conversation face, notice what it says right here. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. All right? So you have, you have uh, God and Moses having a conversation. This is what the conversation looks like right here. 
All right? And, it's, and so this is what we have. So Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you, you have not let me know uh, whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. This is again Moses. Now, if I found favor in your sight, show me your way so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. Remember last week when we looked at you know all the pronouns and 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 you know whose whose people it would be. You know it's it's your people. No, it's your people. It's there. You know you get all this blame shifting going on, and Moses brings back to God a reminder of who, who actually started all this. And he reminds God, says, Consider to this nation, they are your people. And, and now in, he said, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Uh, and, then, and he said to him, this is still Moses speaking, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. Fairly bold statement, isn't it? Uh, well, I mean, they're going, they're, they're, yeah, leave us alone. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not going anywhere if, if you are not going to go. Verse 16, this is for, whenever you see in the Bible for, that is, that gives you substantiation. That gives you reasons for what was just said. So you have, if your presence will not go, don't carry us up from here. Why, what is... What's the reason that Moses is trying to say that? Well, here's, this is why. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and or I and your people unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and who? Your people from every people on the face of the earth. Now this is, what, this is, God's, this is the Lord's response. And the Lord said to Moses, what? I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim before you the name of the Lord. So what we have is that Moses is interceding for the people, and what we discover is that it will be God who goes with them, which is interesting. Um, in verse 13, it says, Now if I found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. That consider, too, does any of your versions have remember? What, yours have remember? Uh, um, the, 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 the better translation should be, uh, and look here, exclamation point. That's that's the uh, that's the literal translation, um, you know. And so what what you have is Moses interceding on behalf uh, of the people, uh, the, the, because the people in question are not Moses's people, but whose people? Right. And so what Moses is doing is reminding the people. I mean, reminding God that the, you know the. Is the, the real issue at stake is will the Lord prove faithful to what he has undertaken to do? Who started all this? There were prayers that went up into chapter 2. He sees, he hears, he understands, he remembers. Those are the four verbs. And then you get chapter 3, the call of Moses. And, and, and the one who's dictating what's going to happen is not Moses but God. And so Moses, in this time of intercession, uh, I mean interceding, he, he, he is, uh, he's calling back to God that ultimately what it, what's at stake is God's reputation. You're the one that's promised to do this. Are, 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 you, are you not going to do it even because of this? And what you have is an answer that God, you know, God goes with them, which is fascinating. My presence in verse, 40, in, in verse 14, does anybody have the phrase, my face? 
That's the literal translation in verse 14 where it says, uh, I mean, he said, my presence, the, the literal there is, is my face will go with you. Uh, it also shows up in verse 20 and verse 23. It says presence, but what really, I mean, the, the, the word there is my face. Right. Well, and what you've got is people uh, translating the Hebrew uh, and giving some, some understanding some, you know, with it. Uh, but, but the idea in verse 14, verse 20, verse 23 is that my face will go. How do you recognize people? By their faces. By their faces. Notice what he says uh, again. Notice what he says. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Well, uh, you get into some commentary on that later on where uh, what you have is um, in the fullness of that being too much to comprehend. But thank you, Gene, because that is where I want to segue next um, into uh, you know, God showing His face, the fullness of it presents a problem. Right. Right, so the problem now is, can Moses withstand the fullness of God? All right, so I want to look at this because uh, what's interesting to me is what does Moses want to see? The fullness, all right, he wants to see his face. Um, but what actually happens? Keep going. Does he see anything? What, no, no, what verb is mentioned? Is it C or is it something else? And I will proclaim. Proclaim what? No, it's more than that. What is it? My name. Right? And what is the name? Ah, so let's talk about that for a little bit. So what you have is in seeing God, what Moses really does is hear God's name. Correct? Right. I mean, you know, all of this looks like he's going to see something. I'm going to hide you in this rock. I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. But then you get to this little part right here that says, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Right? So let's spend a little time with that because this is interesting to me. Because um, what you have is something, you have someone that is transcendent, which means separate. Uh, and if we uh, um, com holy other that now is going to manifest uh, himself in a way to something that is not transcendent, you, does that make sense? And so, uh, and so, what what is what what does that look like? How how, how are we to make sense of that? Um, what's always been interesting to me is that when God does something. And we can talk about it in terms of creating. Um, we can talk about it in terms of uh, giving the law earlier in Exodus. Uh, or we can talk about it in terms of actions even post-Exodus. How does God do these things? How does God create? Go back to your knowledge of Genesis 1. He speaks. That's right. He speaks. How does God give the law? What was another name that we actually used for the law? The words. That's right. Well, hang on. Slow down. Going too fast. Uh, Isaiah 55. Um, turn it to Isaiah 55 for a second. I think it's Isaiah 55. Let me get... Got to get used to this new Bible. Isaiah 55, I think it's verse 10. Somebody finds it before I do. 10 and 12. Uh, yeah, keep going. Verse 11 too. Ah, uh, yeah, perfect. All right, so Isaiah is describing God's actions. And he, and he gives a, an analogy of rain and snow and things like that. But in verse 11 is where you get the key part. So shall my word 
be that goes out from my mouth, and it shall not return to me empty. Isaiah is describing God's action, but when God acts, what does He do? He speaks. That's exactly right. Now because Gene is an eager student and <laughs> likes to go ahead so much, in John 1, 1, 1, turn out of the New Testament, in John 1, somebody read for us verses 1 through 4. All right, yeah, keep going. One through four. Oh, you're just quoting, okay. Well, someone read it unless you can quote. Who is he talking about? Jesus. And we know Jesus as the Word. And so, uh, you know, it's just fascinating to me that what we have is when, you know, Moses wants to see something from God. But what he actually, what actually happens is he hears. And then when we get larger in the scope of what he hears, which is his name, which is the Lord, uh, what we find is that God reveals Himself. Um, the way the Bible describes God revealing Himself is by speaking. And normally He speaks His name. And uh, you see it in the creation. You see it in the giving of the law. You see it in, in the actions. If we just use an example of Isaiah 55. And so in what we would call the, the, the final revelation of knowing God or, or in Jesus Christ, um, what you see is that He is God's Word. Later on, when we look at what Jesus does, if we take John's Gospel and we go a little bit further, the high priestly prayer, what is that, uh, chapter 16? Jesus, when He's talking to God about His disciples, He says, I have spoken to them Everything, every word that you wanted me to speak. And so the gifts that Jesus gives to the church are His words and His Spirit. So I mean, just let it sit for a second. It's, uh, um, I mean, we have a tendency to read over things so fast and, we, and we, sometimes we miss certain things that are going on. God, ha the way that God reveals Himself, this transcendent God who is completely other, reveals Himself by speaking His name. And it ends up creating and speaking His name. It ends up giving insight into what it means to live in covenant. It ends up being action inside of creation. Uh, and then it finally, it, it finally comes to culmination in Jesus Christ who does the same thing. He speaks. Uh, you know, later on he says, uh, there are other, uh, plenty of verses where it talks about, um, you, you know, when you're when you, proclaiming the gospel, going out, the Spirit will give you uh, the words to speak, what to do. Uh, you, know, you know, God speaks uh, and it ends up creating. God speaks and it ends up giving law and, and insight to, to con covenant. God speaks and it ends up giving its action in the world. And, and this whole concept of the Word speaking and God's presence, Spirit, because that's what God is, Spirit, are, are woven together. Um, gosh, I'm not good at drawing, but if you can imagine weaving, all right? So, um, you know, God, Word, Spirit. And they're, they're not separate. They're, they're tied together because this is God revealing Himself to, uh, to the world. Um, it's not where Spirit goes over here and then Word goes over here, but it's Spirit and Word together. And, and, it, ends up, you know, and it ends up with Jesus. Which is... Go ahead. Well, 
Well, I mean, keep in mind, uh, unchanging nature does not mean that the, the, the one who is unchangeable can self-change. Does that make sense? The, the difference is an outside force making change. So when we talk about God uh, being unchangeable, the idea is that God determines if God wants to do something. Does that make, and so, you know, uh, but so if, if there is a, you know, I'm not going to go with you and then I am going to go with you, who determines that? Well, God determined that, all right, uh, which gives you insight into his nature. You know, what you don't want is someone that uh, will change and you don't have insight into the nature. What you get is insight into his nature. I will be gracious. I will show mercy. Right. And so, and so uh, you know, those, just because God goes from, you know, there's going to be an angel. Where is that at? Verse 2. There's going to be an angel. And then it's now it's it's my presence will go with you, uh, you know. Um, the difference is God determines what God wants to do, not an outside force making God do something, uh, and that's a, that's a very pivotal point to understand. Sure, it also tells you insight into the power of intercession on behalf of someone else. If intercession doesn't, and I'm going to use the word affect God, then why do we pray? I mean, that'd be, that'd be the biggest waste of time in the world, all right? Uh, I mean, unless, you, unless there's part of in praying you change, and there's some, there's some goodness to that, but it becomes more of a, a you know, just a, you know, the, the means to the end of prayer is just, you know, first person. And not not others, and and we need so there is that alone that would be good enough to pray because you can change right, um, but you know or and uh, there there is something to this, all right, and that God does pay attention. It's not just you know empty words bouncing off the walls or whatever, or just a personal exercise that you're going through that you hope then will become part of your DNA, which will then produce change inside of you. It's actually both, uh, which is, you know, and there are other examples. Now, we could go through uh, some other examples inside the scriptures where you find, where you find intercession where, where you know, <clears throat> God, for whatever reason, it, it, the situation hasn't changed, there's intercession, and then there are people, then, then it is change. And sometimes it, there's, there's not an answer. I mean, uh, when you get the bulletin, uh, this was today, Tuesday, on whenever it comes to you, uh, Friday or Saturday, uh, uh, part of what I'm writing about is Revelation chapter 11. Well, what's, um, the last part of Revelation chapter 11 is the saints praying to God, don't wait anymore. We're tired. We're ready, you know. And of course, he waits, you know. So I mean, there are times where people intercede, and it, you know, it's not just a just because you intercede that you know, I, like pulling the lever. I'm I'm going to make God do it, uh, but God does pay attention to him. And, and to me, that go back to the parental analogy of how God is seen as a parent caring for his children. Uh, make the analogy with your children or your grandchildren. Do you not pay attention to what your children say? And it doesn't mean just because they say it, you're going to do it. But you, you make the decision on what you will do for the benefit of your children or your grandchildren or whoever. Uh, I mean, you, you, can, you can see that inside the scriptures. And so this, this chapter 33 is very significant because it gives us inside, I mean, it really does paint a wonderful picture of who God is, what His nature is, and, and how that affects uh, how He reveals Himself and how it affects how, how, he inter, how, how He works with people, not just in, in the Exodus text, but later on even... In, in the life of Christ. 
Not a bad chapter. Now, if you read, but now when you read 33, read 32 first, and then because 32 and 33 sit together, they're held in, held held together, um, because this 33 is a answer to what what is God going to do, and what are we or the people going to do now that 32 has taken place? And I mean, you have not just the once over lightly. What you have is revelation. You have restatement, you have encouragement, you know, you have renewal, and then, and then you have revelation. Uh, well, that's, I need to remember, that's kind of three R's. You know, clergy like, you know, alliteration in sermons. So, uh, all right, any, any comments or questions? We're, we're going we're gonna to take a break. We're, we're at the break time. Right. Yeah, the question came up. The, the question is, I mentioned the phrase progressive revelation. Um, pr progressive revelation is the theological concept that though God knows, God has the thought of what's all going to take place, the people that are involved in that do not. And so they only see what's right in front of them. And as they are obedient to what's right in front of them, larger pictures are you know, are exposed even more, um, if that makes sense. If like, say if it's 10 steps to me and to the wall and God wants me to walk to the wall, but I can't see the wall, I can only see what's right in front of me, but I take this step, now I can see the step in front of me, I take that step, now I can see that step in front of me, I can take that step, but from here, I can't see all 10 steps. And so in, in you have, uh, I mean, that's a phrase that, that people, you know, in studying the scriptures, that's a phrase that they see that, that uh, well, for instance, um, Exodus is a perfect example where in the beginning the people are just to go out. Well, when, when they get to Sinai, one of the questions that I asked when we were in chapter 19 and 20 was, was this the real purpose of the destination? In the beginning it was they're going to come out and worship. And then it was they're going to come out and I'm going to give them a land. Well, they're not even close to the land. They went down to this mountain but they had to get what was in the mountains so that when they get into the conquest period, they understand what's going on. And so what God didn't give them was, you're going to go out with me and you're going to have these experiences and oh, and you're going to make a big time mistake, but don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you and, and you're going to stay there for a while. Some of you aren't going to make it because you're stiff neck and, and you're not going to pay attention, and, but eventually you're going to get in and that's going to take a while. You know, you know, th there's not all that. What's given is, come on out. And you know, as they go out, they get... They, they are, they perceive more of the larger picture, and so there's a progressiveness to it. Does that make sense? All right. So, uh, all right. Um, and so, that what I would then the the phrase that I I think that that started that was, if there's progressive revelation, then there's also progressive obedience. As you are obedient to the step in front of you. Now that's a, I don't know if that's a term. Maybe I'm sure a scholar's come up with it, but. Um, there's, that's a phrase that I was using that if you step here and you're obedient there then there's something else that's open to you you're obedient there so you're progressing in your obedience what has to take place is obedience to make it to the wall if that makes sense alright well, let's take a break and take it for uh
It is, I know it. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought you meant in here. I, I got you. All right, uh, let's go ahead and uh, come back together. I, I know it. Did everybody get a copy of the uh, prayer pad? Uh, all right. I've got a few. All right. Who, who's who's missing one? All right. Okay. All right. That's all right. That's okay. All right. Yeah, I think this row is coming down. I'll wait a second and make sure everybody's got a copy. Uh, if, if you don't, if you look on the sides of the of the rows, they might be there. Or the you know the row of rows. Rows, it's like that, you know. When uh, okay, I've got some extras. All right. All right. Let's start there. All right. Um, when. Brooke and I were serving in a, a different part of our state uh, back when Connor, I think, was in, I think it's preschool or kindergarten where you, they have to learn the uh, sight words. And uh, so Brooke would practice with Connor. It's like 200 words they just have to know and remember. And so when I came home from work, uh, I walked in the door and, and Brooke goes, hey, Connor, t- tell your dad your sight words. And they were... That, and I don't even know what the sight words are, but they were, you know, they had four syllables, you know, in one, and and uh, um, and Brooke looked at me and said, uh, "It might be time for us to move." <laughs> said, you know, uh, in a different part of the state. <laughs> yeah. Well, it uh, it was not. Uh, it, it was in the southern. It was still in the South Georgia Conference. Just uh, where we um, like to uh, <laughs> close. Where Sam is a word. That's exactly right. <laughs> Sam, yeah, that's it. You know what I'm talking about. She has a son that lived down there, so uh, he was my neighbor for a while. So uh, yeah, Sam, and uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, but that was interesting. How we all of a sudden she was joking. We did not move for another couple of years, but. <laughs> There was there was a sense of like, all right, it's all good. So, okay, uh, we got a little bit of time left. What I want to do is um, uh, I'd like to hear back from you some. And some of the things that, uh, that were either new or something that has become uh, uh, at least an aspect of your study or, or maybe even some of your theology or, or uh, from the book of Exodus that maybe you didn't know on the front end, or maybe you knew it and it was good to, to read it again. Um, and, and this might take two minutes for us to go through this. It might take longer. So, But are, you know, what are some of the things that stood out to you in the book of Exodus in our study that would be, uh, that you just thought were, was good? Right. Right. Moses raised his hand, Joshua prevailed, but when he got tired, sure. then, then he was defeated. And so Moses, I mean, Aaron and her raised his arm. Right. Side, his hand. Sure, sure. It, I mean, to me, that's where I got my very first look at intercession. Right. And, and, and intercession, if you've, uh, you know, you can get tired. <laughs> I mean, it's a... Uh, you know, part of what, inter- you know, I call it the burden of ministry because when you are interceding, what you really are doing is, is ministering too. And uh, one of the things that's, that can be difficult is when you 
to, to be an intercessor, but not to own all of the situation because it can become consuming. Right. Sure. Sure. Good. Fantastic. Anybody? Jean? Right, right. Right. It's, it's a little bit of uh, not just sap, boom, and go on to the next one. Good. Right. 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 Yeah. The impatience. Uh, you, you know. Um, well, I mean, you know, you can. Now, what would be interesting if we were to take a piece in the New Testament, where how do you learn patience? And there's an epistle that spends some time on that. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, but because it's a, it's a process of uh, that in, that has something to do with experience, and some of it has to do with with faith, and some of it has to do with levels of of revelation. And uh, but you're, I mean, there is something to the children of Israel when they are impatient. Obviously, they they get in trouble. And that's, that's not just a characteristic of the people in Exodus. I mean, it's a characteristic inside of humanity. And, uh, I mean, learning to patiently wait and still be faithful is a very, that, that's, a, that's a very mature, that's a mature character. Right. Yeah, the contemplative service is a, a service we'll pick back up probably the first of the year at some point, and um, it's a style of prayer or worship that uh, is it, it's very ancient in the fact that it was a part of the early church very early on. Um, our, our our style of worship, it, whether it be contemporary or traditional, is very driven. You know the, the 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 architects of the service want to bring you to a certain point, um, and the contemplative service where you end up is up to you, and there are just um, means of worship like reflective prayer or reflective scripture reading that have a lot of time built in. For instance, when in the contemplative service, when when we read a passage together. No, it's either you can read it or someone reads it for you. It might take 10 minutes and you read it repetitively at different speeds. And the idea is to, for instance, like when we're reading that passage from Exodus 33, you know, you might get stuck on the first verse, uh, then, you know, then the Lord said. And, and that becomes where God ministers to you. Someone else might hear stiff-necked people. Someone else might hear the Lord. Someone else might hear the land flowing with milk and honey. And so uh, we, the, the, the leaders of the service are not trying to dictate, you know, or in, under the direction of the Spirit where somebody comes out. And uh, so there's silence that's a fair amount of silence. If the service takes 35, 40 minutes, you know, 20 of it might be silent reflection. And, uh, but all of it is, is done to to, to provide opportunities for ministry. Well, let, let me ask it to you this way, if we can just kind of piggyback on that. How much of your devotional time is spent where you don't speak? Don't answer. Just <laughs> reflect on it. And, uh, and then, but one of the good questions to ask is, why? Is it because we're uncomfortable? 
I mean, are we uncomfortable in God's presence? Maybe. Okay, that's, that's, all right, that's a good thing to some degree. Um, but or how much of your prayers is you, you know, we spend a great deal about inter- time about intercessory prayer. And, and that's, I mean, I, do, I hope that's a part of your wheelhouse of your activity with God and your activity with other people. But are all of your prayers, when you have a time of prayer, is it just telling God what you want? I and mean, that's okay. I mean, that's, God wants to know it. I mean, you know, so don't, don't, don't hear this is not a bad thing. But it needs to be balanced with, well, let's hear what God wants. Well, you know, unless, you know, maybe this is 40 exceptional people who can do 10 things at one time, um, you know, but most of the time for us to hear, well, the Isaiah, what's the Isaiah 30 passage that says, uh, um, you'll hear a, vo- a, a small voice from behind you saying, you know, which way to go, paraphrase there. This is the way walking in it. When you turn to the left, turn to the right, you hear a voice from behind you. And, it, and it's a quiet voice. And there are so many examples in the Bible. The best one for me is, is in Elijah. Elijah goes through a very difficult time, and, and it gets played out over a chapter or two, and he wants to see God. And again, this talks about proclamation as being a form of revelation. Um, and so he's, he's hiding up in a cave, and he's been waiting, he's been fasting, and, and then he has to eat because he's malnourished, and he sleeps because he's fatigued. And, and so then he's ready, he's like, I'm ready, I'm, you know, I bought my ticket, all right, God, give it to me. And there's like a tornado, and then an earthquake, and, and there's like three or four different things that, that pass before him, and he thinks that's God because it's powerful, and it comes with, with force, and none of them are God. And you know where he finds God? And a still silence, and God speaks to him. And so uh, it's interesting. So I, I just encourage you um, part of living a disciplined lifestyle uh, incorporates a host of disciplines. One of them in our society, in Western society, that is, it is lost as a whole, I'm speaking generally here, is the discipline of silence and, and just sitting. And, um, and if, if, if that's something that's new for you, start with a minute, okay? Because it's going to seem like a forever. And, you know, build up. You know, what would it be like if in the mornings you just didn't speak? Well, um, that, 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 that takes, no, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's practice, okay? We, we put out a book not too long ago that's called The Methods of Prayer. And, and it's a good book, and I, if you don't have it, I commend it to you because it has about seven or eight different ways that you can pray. You know, one of them uh, is what we call a, a, just a, a breath prayer, and it's as you breathe in and out, maybe you quote a verse, you know, or, or you know, the Lord be with you, breathing in, breathing out. Um, now, it took me forever to learn this, so Joanne, that's a great question. I, I used to have an associate she excelled at this, and it would drive me crazy for about a year because we would pray together in our, our time of meeting, and you know, before we'd even pray, she would just slow her breathing down. And I thought, what type of garbage? I mean, I literally was just like, I got about a thousand things on my to-do list, and this is not one of them. And I'm serious. I'm just being honest. And I mean, I, I detest it because I thought she would, sometimes it was about, when it was her time to lead, she would, she would slow her breathing down and, uh, to try to relax. And, um, and I just, you know, then finally I thought, all right, well, you might as well embrace it if you can't change it, right? And so um, I started doing it. And it started, I was like, wow, there really is some purpose behind this. And, How do you do it? pardon me? How do you do it? Just sit, sit for three or four minutes and, Don't no, deep, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, deep, deep. You know, don't hyperventilate, but deep breath. Slow, 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 slow it down a little bit. And uh, but you know, um, most of the time we don't even do that. Okay, and so, but but it's not just breathing and whether or not you're breathing at a normal rate or a slower rate. Turn that into a discipline. As you're breathing in, focus on. You know, focus on something of God. As you're breathing out, focus on something else. And what that does, Joanne, over time is you'll, you'll get in the habit 
where you don't have to teach yourself to do that. Well, what that does is that just, you're carving out space and time. And, and, and that's, we don't, I mean, our whole life is built around a calendar and a clock. And noise. Right, and noise. Yeah. Right, and so, you know, well, and this. Let this not be the first thing you grab when you get up and to see what everybody else is doing. Okay, I mean, fast, there are degrees of fasting. Fasting isn't always with food. Um, fast from media, okay? I mean, the world's not going to stop, I promise you, all right? And so, but, but you will stop for a minute. So slow down for a bit and carve out some space. One of the things that you can do is as your mind starts to go in all different directions, make that a matter of prayer. God, why am I thinking about this? Why is this the first thought that runs in my mind? A am, I, am I afraid? Am I concerned? Um, you know, there, there's a reason why it does. I mean, all we're after is um, inviting God into that process. And, and so uh, um, the reflective, the contemplative lifestyle um, doesn't necessarily try to force a certain thought. The contemplative lifestyle is, well, if I'm thinking about this, why God am I, why, help me understand why I'm thinking about this. Does, is it, is it something that is good and healthy that adds to my faith or is it something that doesn't? And if it doesn't, why is that my first dominant thought? And normally it's tied to something that's on the inside. And, um, you know, and if you want to see this, go back and look at some of the gospels. And this is just the beauty of Jesus to me. Watch whenever there's a situation, watch the disciples' reactions to the situations and then compare that to Jesus' reactions. And they're anxious and they're, they're nervous and they're talking and, and Jesus is just sitting back. You know, why, why are you even doing this? Oh, ye. Yeah, right, right, right. And so, you know, there's a sense of where he's, and I'm going to use the word control because I, I can't come up with another one at this time. Jesus is very self-aware and in touch with the Father with everything that He does. And so there's not words or actions that, that happen. Now, they might be just automatic, you know, just a, just a, a straight action that would be just a, what we would do. Uh, but there's always a thought that goes before an action. Our actions just get reinforced so much that it just... Ha the time that it takes from a thought to the actual action behind a thought might be, you know, a millisecond. But there still is a thought and then an action. And what, what we want as followers of God is to, in developing a disciplined lifestyle, train ourselves so that what happens automatic is just a, just a reaction where thought and action are so woven into uh, um, our relationship with God that it happens automatically. Does that make sense? And so, well, in the beginning, you have to, you have to work to, to train yourself with that. So um, uh, a, a great, one of the best times to be silent and be reflective is when you get angry. All right? Or, or when you feel a sense of... Uh, where, you know, um, to ask, you know, when you get angry or when you feel, what breaks your heart, all right? So it could sometimes could be a different thing, just not just with anger. But that'll tell you what's on the inside. That'll tell you what's driving, driving your bus. And so what we want to do is invite God into that because it might be something that's good, grand, and glorious, and we want God to, to continue to develop that. Um, I see something where people hurt somebody else and I feel broken by that. Well, I can promise you God feels broken too. So that's a good thing. Or, or it could be the opposite that uh, I didn't like what happened and so I'm angry because of that. Well, don't be afraid to investigate why. I mean, why, you know, that's a great question to ask of yourself. All the contemplative life, all the contemplative prayer service does is just give you time for that. And, and you know, we do it in the chapel. And it's a, it's a very, it's, a, it's just a sweet, quiet service. That's the best way I could describe it. And, uh, but it's a different style of worship because most of our worship is we're generating something. And there's not, that's not bad. It's just a, 
you know, it, some of you will go eat lunch and y'all eat a hamburger. Somebody will go eat lunch and eat some salad. Somebody will go eat lunch and eat some chicken. You know, you need them all, all right? So this is just a different way of, of doing it. There was a hand maybe back here. Right, right. Yeah. Right, and, and that's called the, and, and in that book, that Methods of Prayer book, that's called the Jesus Prayer. And, and it's, it's uh, um, I mean, think about how a child learns, okay? A child learns by repetition. I mean, we teach repetition, okay? Well, it's what we want to do. We, wanna, we want to use uh, repetition um, that's a form of catechism. That's a form of study and learning that's been a part of the church and been a part of pedagogy for I mean, teaching for, you know, forever. And, and so what we would do is we would, this is the reason why we do the creeds, in a small, it is small compared to grand theology, just in a, a two paragraph, two or three paragraphs, we teach what is core to the Christian faith. That's all the creeds are. And so in repeating them in worship is not to, you know, oh, let's just run through this because this is what, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's hopefully you can say this without, without, I mean, it's automatic, okay? And so if you want to know what, what's the basics of Christian theology, well, I believe it. I believe. I believe what? In God the Father, you know, on down the line. Same thing with the Lord's Prayer. Teach us to pray. Well, if you want a method to learn to pray, Pray conceptually what shows up in the Lord's Prayer. So um, all of it is, again, you know, same with reading Scripture. Uh, we're going to start Philippians next week. Well, your task is to read through, like we do every time, read through it twice without stopping. Out loud. Out loud, that's right. Why? Because it forces you to look at every single word. Is that method of prayer by Matthew Henry? No. Uh, I don't know. Uh, no, it's a book that we put out, that St. Paul put out. Uh, it's called, Met it's a little white pamphlet, you know. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, th there's a, another prayer that's called the Examine. Now, if you want to work on contemplative type prayer, the Examine is before you go to sleep at night, without any noise in the room, uh, light can be on or off, um, ask yourself two questions. God, first... Reveal to me this week where I got, to, I mean this day, when I'm looking back on the day, reflecting on what I just did, reveal to me where I got it right. Bring back the situation. All right? Reveal to me the place where I got it right. Okay? Now you know what the next question is. Reveal to me one place where I didn't get it right. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, just start, start with one, okay? Well, all right, so then, then what you do is you unpack both of those. What led to you getting it right? Were you prompted by the Holy Spirit? Did you, could you in what I call third person, you know, were you aware enough of what God was doing through the role of the Spirit when the Spirit says, Shane, pick up your phone while I picked it up? And I got it right. All right, so what, what, what did it, you know, how did I sense God's presence? How did I hear that voice from behind me saying, go to the left or go to the right? And I want to I stay with that. I want to teach myself to listen for that. You know, uh, you know, where did I get it wrong? Well, what was I doing? Was there a thousand noises going on? Was I so busy that I wasn't paying attention to anybody? You know, where, t why did I not hear, if, I, if there was one place where I got it right, where I heard the voice of God and I responded? Where was the place where I didn't hear the voice of God and, and I didn't respond? What was going on? Well, analyze that. Uh, you know, the, the idea, I mean, surely God wants us to know it. And this is not something where, you know, God is, all right, well, here's Shane again. Man, I'll tell you what, how many times I got I mean, you know, it's like with, you know, we meet face to face. You know, I want you, this I will do. I mean, it's not where, where God is an angry parent and, you know, you've got to come and appease God before he even opens it up. I promise you, he's already waiting for us. I mean, you know, the, the Luke 15 is a beautiful, beautiful chapter in the Bible. It is three parables. I want to mention something about my daughter. 
Okay. okay. Sure. No, that's right. The way you went to law school and Catholic law school, graduated, practiced all, then decided for whatever reason she, anyway, she went to Hong Kong and mm -hmm. I made an appointment in, uh, and she had to get a, before you could do anything there, you had to get a job first. So she applied at various places. She got a job at this big British Commonwealth school, started Catholic school, started 1855 for sort of uh, high school uh, Asians and then Westerners. And uh, so she got there and took the job. The money was really excited. I said, well, did they make you go to mass? She said, yeah, every day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, good for you. You know, she didn't want to go to church, right? It just cracked me up that it turned out. <laughs> and now she's going five days a week. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was going to turn out anything like that. And here she is for a year. Now she's going to take mass five days a week. Right. And I thought, ha, ha, ha. Well, <laughs> you know. So, you know, and one of the things we'd want to ask her is that, okay, there are times in the Mass where, you know, are you getting it, you know? And, and so. And, she's in it now already. Six it, weeks she's been teaching now. It's not quite too much. Right. And I can see it. She sounds different to me about sure. how she's thinking about it. Right? Sure. I mean, now it's well, okay to do it. And the power of worship. I mean, there's, you know, it, it really does work, okay? And, um, and so there's something to being centered in the presence of God. Uh, it, it, that's just the, the, the wonder of God. I mean, don't, you, you know, part of what, and this, this, this is a problem for clergy. It might not be a problem for you. The problem for clergy is they're used to explaining things about God that they can lose just the wonder and the joy of it. It's like when you, you know, it's like those movies where, you know, the professional players end up just playing like they were when they were little kids and they have fun and you know where it's not a job okay and, and so and one of the, and that that can that can affect the you know the christian i mean and, and the longer you're a christian the longer you walk with god the greater that temptation can be and so don't lose the time that's just wonder you know one of the things um you know uh and, and i'm gonna stop with this but i'll i'll be I'll, I'll be, uh, you know, I'll confess. The, the, um, the seriously, the last uh, four, three, four months been very difficult for me. I feel like I've been in the fog, and uh, and so, so so much of it is fatigue. Um, I'm waiting to be approved so I can take another sleep study, and because uh, I mean, I, you have to have insurance with sleep apnea and all that stuff. And so uh, I took one study not too long ago, and they said I didn't have it anymore, which I thought, okay, that's amazing. I didn't know I could, you know, it could go away. Um, but I'm, you know, so there's just, there's a lot of things mixed into that fatigue, uh, schedule, uh, all that. And, and so um, what, so I've been reflecting on that. I've been asking, all right, God, what, you know, is this something that is just this a season of wilderness, so I need to learn something? Or, you know, is it something that I'm doing that is, that because I've done this little by little, uh, you know, what's, you know, I'm, I'm now living into just the small steps I've been, been taking. And, and, and it, some clarity has come over the last week. And uh, it came around, why don't you just sit and rediscover the joy of God? And so uh, what I've been, you know, and I said, okay, listen, I'll, I'll embrace that. I'm, you know, I'm a big boy. And so um, I, I, the other day I find myself singing hymns for the first time in about six months. All right. So th there's, it, it can be a temptation for all of us. All right. And so um, the closer you are with proximity to God, the more you, sh the, the larger certain temptations can be. And the idea that says, I've got it because I've been around it for a long time, that is a temptation that manifests itself all throughout the scriptures. And it's not for the person who's day one. It's the, for the person who's year 50. Okay? And so, you know, find disciplines that allow you to rediscover why you believe in the first place. I hope it's not just because you don't want to go to hell. All right. I mean, you know, that's the small part of it. You know, Wesley started. Listen, class meetings. Seriously, class meetings. You know what? You know what the the issue for class meetings? Just the entrance in. The first entrance was, do you want to do you want to flee the wrath to come? 
And people would come, and then what they taught them was the joy of their salvation. So the real issue is not the, to flee. I mean, that's, you know, that's a benefit, okay? So, I mean, the, the rediscover why you want to be connected to God in the first place. And allow that to, 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 you know, my cup anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. All right, there's the five-minute sermon. Go in peace. May the Lord be with you.